You might notice it already if you have it in your Bibles, but today we're going to talk about the transfiguration. And sometimes people ask, what does that even mean? Transfiguration? What is that? Well, the word translated to tell us that Jesus transfigured in the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek, comes from the word metamorpho. And just seeing that word alone, that might already let you know what it means, right? That's what we get the word metamorphosis from. So saying the transfiguration is basically the same as saying the transformation. There's a transition of Christ's figure. The way Christ looks is going to change for a brief moment in time, as we will see. Now, we left off last time with Jesus's words on how those who would follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross. But in the end of that part, he started talking about his second coming, which still has not happened yet as as of now. Uh, But if you look back a couple of verses before Matthew 17, look back at Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. It says, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will, then he will repay each person according to what he has done. That's talking about when Jesus comes back. But what we did not touch on last week is the next verse, verse 28, where he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now he's talking to the disciples here, and the impression that you get is that he's talking about the second coming, because that's literally what he just has been talking about, the second coming, which again, still has not happened even almost 2,000 years later. But he's saying that to some people who are standing right there, and he's saying that they will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom or in his royal splendor. Now, in a way, the disciples will not face the second death ever, except for maybe Judas, the second death being hell. So in a way, some disciples will not have died in that sense when the second coming happens. However, that doesn't seem to be what's being said, right? Because it doesn't, it's not something that seems very exclusive when it comes to the disciples that Jesus is talking to. And it doesn't really seem to be talking about the second death anyway, because again, they're never going to face that. It seems like it's likely talking about physical death, and all of them have already died, right? The disciples are not physically alive on this earth anymore. So they have all tasted death, and still, Jesus' second coming has not happened. But what is the transfiguration? It's not his actual second coming, but in context, it does have to do with his second coming. It's almost a preview of his second coming. And all this says is the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Is that talking about the second coming? Yes. But can that be talking about more than just the second coming? Can those words be fulfilled in more than one way? Can some of those who are standing there see the Son of Man coming in his royal splendor without seeing his actual second coming? Yes. Also, yes. Every time that we see Jesus saying this, that we see him say that those who are standing here, there were some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Every time we see Jesus saying this in all three Gospels where it's talked about, it's followed up directly with the story of the transfiguration. It looks like what you see right here in verse 1 of chapter 17. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, James's brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. 
Look at what it says in Mark. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. It's almost the exact same thing in Luke as well. Although Luke's sources didn't seem to know exactly how many days it was. Uh, there's a bit of uncertainty with Luke. He says, but I tell, or he says that Jesus says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. And I love how God uses human authors to write his scriptures, and it still turns out to be the truth. Because even with Luke, even when Luke doesn't know the exact amount of days, which again is six, he makes it approximate. It was about eight days after he said that. It's like if we say it was about two weeks ago and actually it was 16 days instead of 14 or maybe 12 days instead of 14, right? So just because of that doesn't mean, right, that he's wrong. It's still true to say you know, about eight days, because six days is around eight days, about eight days, right? But what we see here is that this quote of some standing here will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, in power, the kingdom of God, it always, always leads into this transfiguration story. Every time, every time it does. And Mark, Mark doesn't even usually give a count of days in most of the stories that he talks about. But this is a time where he finds it important to say, this was six days later. Three of the disciples in this story, three men who were standing there when those words were spoken, they are about to see it. The kingdom of God in power. The Son of Man shining bright. So let's read Matthew 17, verses 1 to 13. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. God, as we head into this time of looking into your word, of seeing what you have uh, in this passage for us. I just pray that you would be with me in the name of Jesus. My, my head is a little bit uh, tired and, and, and I just want to bring clarity. And so I just pray that you'd help me um, to have energy for this in the name of Jesus. I pray that you'd just help me to have clarity of words in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would work through this, Lord, that you would work in each one of our hearts here, even mine, to bring about your will in the name of Jesus. Again, if I say anything that might be wrong or untrue, I pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I do not want to lead anybody astray. But Lord, I pray that your truths would be remembered 
and that your truths would be believed in the name of Jesus and that you would give us understanding of those truths in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord, for your goodness. And I pray this all in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. It's really cool to see Moses here. I feel like we've rarely talked about Moses except to maybe say the law of Moses. Like we've talked about Elijah a few times already going through Matthew. We've talked about some other famous Old Testament figures like Jonah, like Abraham. Before Matthew, we even went through the books of 2 Samuel, uh, or we went through 1 Samuel, and then we went through 2 Samuel a little while later. So we saw a lot of David. But Moses, we haven't really talked about Moses too much. So let's take some time to talk about him. There's a lot surrounding Moses that has to do with salvation. In ancient Egypt, Pharaoh wanted all the Hebrew male babies to be killed, but Moses, his mother, or Moses' mother, sorry, put him in a basket on the Nile where, of course, he eventually ended up being saved, right? There's salvation. He ended up saved and adopted by Pharaoh's own daughter, even. Years and years later, we have the great salvation event of the Israelites coming out of slavery, being chased down by their former slave masters, the Egyptians. But then, of course, God parted the Red Sea, and Moses led his people safely across. But then, we have another salvation event. When Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness, in the desert, and they thirst. They need water. Numbers 20 tells us, Now there was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and said, Would that we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. The Israelites do this a lot. They grumble and they complain about so much when they've just seen one of the most amazing miracles of all time, the parting of the Red Sea, their own salvation, which showed them God will save them, right? At least if they let him. But the people don't trust him which is so frustrating for Moses, who's trying to lead them, trying to let them know, hey, God is looking after us. He will provide. So he goes to God to see what he should do. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the staff, And assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give drink to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. But there's all this stress of dealing with Thousands and thousands and thousands of complaining Israelites, right? He's leading an entire nation. Just think about how stressful that would be to lead an entire nation who just complains and complains and complains. Plus, he also actually just lost his sister right before this. Miriam had just passed away. And it all seems to be building up to this boiling point where Moses just lashes out. It says, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hands, and he struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock. So there you go, salvation. The people were without water in the wilderness. They faced death, But God provided water for them in the wilderness, even after all their grumbling. However, we see here, Moses' anger caused him to both take glory for himself 
and to not actually follow God's instructions. The second thing there seems to make sense as there was an earlier time where water came from a rock that Moses was actually instructed to strike. But this time, the instruction was not to strike the rock, but to speak to it. However, what adds to what Moses does wrong here is how Moses said about he and his brother Aaron, here now you rebels shall we bring water for you out of this rock. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? God was not glorified. God was not shown to be holy, set apart. And the next verses we see, the next verses show us that God is not pleased. It says, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. No longer would it be Moses that would lead the people into the promised land. He would still lead the people, but not beyond the Jordan River. He himself would never enter the promised land. He got to see it from afar. Before he died, he went up onto Mount Nebo in modern-day Jordan. But back then, it was Moab. And he looked across to the promised land. It says in Deuteronomy that when he was up there, the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not Go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. God buried him. Nobody knows where Moses was buried because no human buried him. God did. So Moses dies. But what happens next is this really unique thing that he was buried by God himself. So Moses was still honored greatly by the Lord, even though his sin ultimately caused him not to be able to enter the promised land. Until this story, today's story, until Jesus, which gives us this little illustration of without Jesus, you will never enter the promised land of heaven You can't go in because of your sin. But if you do have Jesus, then you are welcome in. So let's read again the story of Moses finally entering the promised land to meet with Jesus. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. That is the transfiguration right there. Jesus' appearance transforms into this being of light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. What are they talking about? Luke at least knows the topic of discussion. He says, And behold, two men. We're talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they were talking about how Jesus was going to make his exit, death, resurrection, ascension. In fact, the word for departure here means more clearly exodus. Exodus, a very familiar term for people who read about Moses, right? The salvation that God brought through the leadership of Moses, that was the Exodus, right? God set his people free. God brought Israel out of the bondage of slavery from Egypt, out of the bondage of Egypt's slavery. Now, he's talking about it to Moses, something better, right? Another Exodus, in a sense. God making his way or making a way to bring humanity out of the bondage of sin's slavery, a more lethal slave master than Pharaoh. Moses is hearing about a greater salvation, a salvation that doesn't just bring you into the promised land of Canaan, where Israel is, 
but a salvation that brings you into a better promised land, the heavenly kingdom of God. Not just a land of milk and honey, a land of perfect joy, perfect peace, and perfect rest that can now be obtained because of Christ's death and resurrection that he was talking to Moses and Elijah about. If you genuinely place your belief in his death on the cross for your sins and in his resurrection, if your faith is truly in the Lord Jesus, then you will enter that rest, that eternal life. Again, with sin, you can't go in. But if you are in Christ, if you have Jesus, then after you die, you will be rid of your sinful flesh, made perfect, and welcome into the promised land of heaven. Now, why is it Moses and Elijah who appear? Out of all the important people in the Old Testament, why them? And, and I don't know, are they the most important? Because I think it's likely that Abraham would be considered the most important out of the Jewish forefathers. So again, why these two? Well, the Jews often referred to the Old Testament scriptures as the law and the prophets, who best represents the law? Absolutely Moses. Abs there's not even a question. Sometimes the Jews would even just say the name Moses when they were referring to the law. They'd just call it Moses. Now for the prophets, Elijah is probably the most prominent, although he never actually wrote any of the books of the prophets, like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Zechariah did. But I don't think any prophet was more important to the Jews than Elijah, other than Moses, who's already there. And Elijah is also the prophet that they're all expecting to come back at some point. During the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, or the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So he speaks to the people about fulfilling the law and the prophets, but now he speaks to the law and the prophets themselves about what he will fulfill. Another thing that we learn from Luke is that the disciples here were heavy with sleep. They weren't really awake for a lot of what happens here, but they still go or they still get to see Jesus' glory and Jesus' light. Luke says, Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. The Gospel of Mark says, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. So Peter is terrified of all that's going on. It looks like Moses and Elijah are about to leave. So it's just like, I got to say something. And what comes out is, Rabbi, let's set up some tents. Which is interesting that it's mentioned in all three accounts. Because it just seems like something that's all of a sudden just drowned out and overshadowed and, and not really paid attention to. Because all of a sudden, while he's saying it, the big thing starts happening. Look at verse 5 in our text. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. If there was ever any doubt at all as to whether Jesus was the Son of God or not, this took all of that away, right? The Father's voice audibly comes from the cloud and says, this is my Son. This is my beloved Son. That's as clear as it gets for those who are there on the mountain. God confirms that Jesus is indeed who Moses talked about around 1400 years earlier in Deuteronomy when he tells Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, for, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And it further terrifies the three disciples, right? They are in the presence of the Almighty God. Verse 6 
says, when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But, and I, and I love this part, Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And then together they all go down the mountain, right? And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Tell no one. And they didn't. They didn't do that, as far as we know, at least, until after the resurrection. We hear about it again years and years later in Peter's second letter, where he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made, or when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this sentence here, it kind of gives that similar wording that we saw at the end of the chapter last week, where it says there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the coming, or the Son of Man coming in his royal splendor. Peter himself was an eyewitness to that majesty. For we did not, clev- we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we, were made, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. The words of Jesus after bringing up his second coming point to the real second coming, but also the preview of his second coming that Peter saw with his own eyes. Now, there was a lot of confusion at the time of Jesus' first coming because he didn't seem to be in a lot of ways what he was prophesied to be. For example, Isaiah prophesies that he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. And then the prophet Micah declares, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. The Jews are looking for a conquering king, who will wipe out the wicked, right? who will wipe out their enemies, who will rule and reign and establish his kingdom in Israel. Instead, though, what they think they see is, here's this guy from Nazareth. He's doing miracles. He's special. But I'm I'm not sure even if many people actually knew that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But they didn't see Jesus like this. Right? They never saw Jesus, they never saw what happened at the transfiguration, right? To prove that Jesus was who he said he was. Only Peter, James, and John saw that. And Jesus, again, is not public about everything. He doesn't want this transfiguration to be known. And last week, we saw, too, that he told his disciples not to make it public that he was the Christ, the Messiah. After the feeding of the 5,000, people were ready to make him, but they were ready to make him king by force, right? They were ready to just go, make, declare him king, but he didn't want that, right? This was not the time to be shown on earth as king. But that's not clear to everyone, right? It's not clear to everyone that the coming of the Messiah has two phases. It's not clear that he comes to earth on two separate occasions. People think that it's all supposed to happen at once, which makes sense, but that's not how it is, right? Some prophecies were fulfilled in the first coming, but others won't be until the second. Even in this single verse here, you have a first coming prophecy that he's coming from Bethlehem, and then a second coming prophecy that he will be ruler in Israel. In Israel, right? So there's a lot of confusion at the time of Jesus' first coming, his time on earth here in this text. Speaking of confusion, 
James, John, and Peter are also confused about why Elijah appeared then after Jesus, the Messiah, had already come. In their mind, Elijah was supposed to precede, like precede the Messiah. And they're right. The Elijah that was prophesied to come was supposed to precede the Messiah. Verse 10, and the disciples asked him, then why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. It hadn't been long since John the Baptist's death, So they knew then who Elijah, who was prophesied to come, actually was, that it was John the Baptist. And it was different than Elijah himself, right? Elijah, who was just right there then on the mountain. And and it wasn't a reincarnation or anything like that. Um, It says in Luke 1, uh, he, John, will turn away many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. So that's how he's Elijah. He's not just the actual Elijah, right? To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So in that sense, Elijah did precede the Messiah. But... It does seem like Jesus is also saying that this is not the only time that this will happen. Again, showing that there are two separate comings of the Messiah. John the Baptist preceded the first coming of Jesus. But it seems like something similar might happen again. Because Jesus says at first, Elijah does come and he will restore all things before he says, but I tell you that Elijah has already come. It seems like when he says he will restore all things, that he's pointing to the future. So it's likely that the real Elijah that was there for the transfiguration, either him or maybe someone else who just, again, comes in the spirit of Elijah, will be another forerunner. There'll be a forerunner to Christ's second coming, that turns, like it says, the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. But again, you've got to be careful because Elijah's most famous miracle is on Mount Carmel, where fire comes down from heaven to prove that God is the one true God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and of Israel is the one true God. And we see in the future that something similar happens We see in Revelation a prophet arises who will also call down fire, but Revelation warns us that this time it's actually a false prophet. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. So if anything like that ever does happen in our lifetime, in any of our lifetimes, uh, don't be fooled by it. Uh, The true Elijah, you'll recognize him by someone who wants to bring glory to God, the one true God. The false prophet wants to bring glory to himself. So, that's a lot of details. We've gone over a lot of details in this message. It's a very detail-heavy message this week, more informational than motivational, perhaps. The point of the story is to prove in glory that Jesus is the Son of God and to preview his second coming, recognizing it as a separate event from his first coming. But just for some motivation, I will say, I want to conclude by drawing your attention to one little sentence that I've drawn almost no attention to this whole time. Remember this in your daily life, in all that you do, take into account all the words of the Lord in this book. Remember what God says of the glorified Jesus, his son shining bright, and take his words to heart from the end of verse 5. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your goodness. And it's amazing to see your salvation and all these different things. Looking at the life of Moses, their salvation, their salvation. But even just the part where he doesn't even get to the promised land until Jesus. I think that's such a cool um, view, such a cool way of, of seeing a uh, uh, parallel to our own salvation of how we can't enter into your promised land with sin still on us. But with Jesus, we can enter in. And only with Jesus. Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. So thank you, Lord, that we have found that way. Thank you, Lord, that we, uh, if we've placed our faith in Christ and what he's done for us, that we have found that uh, entryway into heaven, that found that only way into heaven, and that we will enter that promised land where there will be rest. And Lord, I just pray that because of that, because we found that way, that we would, of course, listen to him, that we would listen to Jesus, that we would look at the words in here, we would pay attention to them, and not only that, but we would live by them, Lord. Help us to live by them in the name of Jesus. You are so good, and I know today was a very um, heavy, detail-filled message, but I just pray that those details, um, the ones that you want us to remember, would not go away. And that we would always remember to listen to your son, to listen to you as well, but of course to listen to Jesus. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.